This is Teachers Talk Radio. Welcome to the Friday morning break with John Gibbs as I continue to explore, after a career in education, what schools are for. This week, my guest is Dr. Christina Costa, Associate Professor at Durham University. She's carried out extensive research into the effects of the digital world on schools. This is Teachers Talk Radio. Tune in ttradio.org. Download the Podbean app and search Teachers Talk Radio. Follow the hashtag TT Radio. Tune in with Teachers Talk Radio. And we're back with my guest, uh, Christina Costa. So thank you so much for joining me this week on Teachers Talk Radio. As my listeners, all of them, will know, uh, what this show does is try to, to explore what schools are for. And uh, I think just as we were saying before we start, I started recording, what, what could be more interesting right now than digital technologies and the changing technolog- technological environment of schools? It really is a fascinating time we do live in. So thank you for joining me. Thank you for having me. Um, and yes, I, I think that it's a, it's a kind of a fascinating time, especially coming, I don't know if we can already call it the aftermath of the pandemic, uh, which has accelerated um, the use of technology um, in, in, in education. And I think, you know, uh, the optimistic self, uh, you know, and a lot of people thought the same was that, uh, this acceleration of technology would uh, uh, give digital education a new lease of life. And, and I think in a way it has, uh, but it also has kind of disclosed a lot of inequalities, uh, some of the digital kind, some uh, that are kind of compounded by other existing inequalities. And, and I think also um, has kind of showed how we are probably not prepared yet for a, a, a kind of a full digital education world. So there's, I think there's a lot of things here that need to be unpacked in that sense. Yeah, I'm glad you started by re- referencing the lockdown and uh, and COVID and so on, because I, I, I don't know, if, I think someone described it as like the tide going out. You see all the stuff on the beach that you didn't know was there, all the wrecks and things. And a crisis like that, and the, and the dramatic effect it had on the shutdown of schools and so on, did reveal an awful lot. I mean, there's probably some good legacies from it, if, if we can think of those. And it, but it did let, make us think a lot about what schools can and can't do with, with um, technology. I mean, I, I, I retired now, but I only retired just at the beginning of the lockdown. I remember teaching lessons online. And I wasn't sure what I thought about it. I thought, well, this is quite useful. It's also quite difficult. And it's also quite limited. <laughs> What do you think the, the lasting legacy, digitally, as it were, of the of COVID will be? I think people are more um, open to using technologies. Um, and in the space of, uh, you know, education, and especially schools, um, I think it kind of uh, brought a new dimension um, in terms of also connection with parents, um, community, um, and, and that kind of interaction with uh, with teachers. I think there's, there's people have probably more open or at least more aware of, uh, of that um, aspect. And, and I think that uh, there's been pockets of, of uh, interesting, you know, and innovative practice. If, if these are kind of loaded uh, uh, kind of concepts, but uh, that, um, that I think, you know, it might uh, stay. Um, and I hope it does stay um, because I think, it, you know, as you were talking about the what is education for um, education as a as a great duty in terms of how uh, you know we we serve society that is the the kind of the functional perspective of education but within that is how do we prepare the individuals um, to be good citizens um, and the digital world is now a key challenge uh, for education with regards to that. Um, so it, it, I think what it brought is, is there's probably less opportunity now to, to ignore, uh, the role of technology in, in education, um, and, and it kind of gives us an, a kind of an opportunity 
to rethink what that can be um, beyond what was already there. Uh, so, you know, there was already the ICT type of skills that uh, uh, were embedded in, com- you know, in computing and, uh, and some disciplines, but how can we make this across uh, a more holistic way of, of learning? Because it is outside, you know, uh, children outside of, uh, of schools, are always harnessing these technologies for for their own benefit. You know, I remember uh, years ago when I was still in Glasgow, um, I was doing um, research with uh, with a the school there, and one of the things that I used to to ask um, children is, um, you know, how were they using technology for their studies? And it was pretty much what was guided by the teachers, which is not a bad thing. But then if I so if you have a problem with your bike or, you know, with something that needs to be fixed, what what is your first protocol? And all of a sudden there was there was another element in the room, which was uh, either uh, a YouTube tutorial or, you know, whatever uh, digital resource was available to them. So they there was this kind of idea that these technologies were part of their learning, but didn't count because it was not part of what it was done in that, education. That is fascinating. And I, before we started, when I was thinking about this this discussion, I I, met, I wrote down that well, I'm thinking to myself, well, of course there is. There are sort of two educational worlds. There's the world of the controlled world of the school and teaching you the school the, the skills you think that the people will need, need in the future. You know how to use this particular laptop, how to use this particular program, how to use these these things. And it's so difficult to predict the future that they're almost certainly going to be wrong. <laughs> and then there's the other. Yeah, the more up-to-date world is the, 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 the organic world of the kids. As you say, they're exploring it themselves anyway, and their skills are developing in ways, and they're using them, using the technology in ways that these, the classroom can't necessarily predict or, keep, or even keep up with. Yeah, I, I think that's where, you know, one of the things that I, I, um, I'm i very keen on is is focusing on, on a curriculum that uh, integrates uh, social practices. Um, and, and I think that's something that, um, you know, even with develops now of AI, <laughs> it's going to be very important uh, to to think about this uh, in this way, so that things are are kind of the application that we make in education have meaning um, elsewhere. Um, obviously, as we were talking just before we started uh, um, this discussion, there's been a big change in in how technology, you know. Um, is being approached and 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 uh, and how technology has developed. You know, um, I was saying that even like ten years ago, it looked very different. Um, and, and what makes it look so different is that the technologies that we are have access to, you know, uh, young people have access to TikToks and Instagrams and uh, Be Real and all all these tools. Um, they they're wrapped into a more kind of commercial, uh, so they're free, but they're commercial at the same time in a, in a kind of a system that, uh, you know, kind of connects with uh, with issues of privacy, of data um, that are quite risky for uh, the educational system. And so when I started using technologies, this was all very exciting because these these issues or these risks were not yet in our imagination because the first wave of kind of more social technologies um, were not yet commercialized to the level that they are today. So there was this more appetite to, to think about uh, these technologies and, and harness those technologies that were outside of, you know, the school institutionalized type of technologies uh, and this is this is kind of an aspect that we need now to rethink not that I'm advocating in any way that we should be uh, you know you bringing those technologies into education because of the risks that they imply in terms of datification and and, uh, and privacy uh, issues but there might be spaces within education where we can, bring the good part of those technologies or the practices that those technologies uh, um, empower, which is aspects of creation, you know, uh, aspects of participation, of dialogue, of working together, uh, which, you know, 
as well in this digital world, more often than not, that is now being a lot replaced with with more an individualized approach. But I think we can rescue what was the main purpose of these technologies, which was the social aspect and, and the social lives that can be created through these spaces um, as instance of learning. Um, and that is the part that is exciting, but it's the part that is quite challenging right now uh, because a lot of the technologies that we have access to uh, and that are endorsed um, you know, institutionally are more often than not also um, shaped by that aspect of surveillance or, or by kind of trying to circumvent risk. So more often than not, we students don't have the same rights of usability as, as teachers. Uh, so that it creates power relationships that then makes these these uh, activities less uh, um, spontaneous, I think. You're listening to the Friday Morning Break with John Gibbs. My guest this week, Dr. Christina Costa, Associate Professor at Durham University. We are discussing her research into schools in a digital world. It's time for a fresh start to language learning. Pearson Edexcel's new student-centred French, German and Spanish 2024 GCSEs cater to the needs of all learners, regardless of their background, ability or reason for studying. Rooted in learned language knowledge, their assessments are transparent and accessible, allowing all students to showcase their language skills. Through inclusive and relatable content, the new Pearson Edexcel MFL GCSEs build a shared cultural capital that helps students develop an understanding of and appreciation for the wider world. Find out more at go.pearson.com forward slash MFL GCSE 24. This programme has been brought to you by The Happy Confident Company. Our clinically approved, ready-to-go, well-being and mental health programme will help your pupils thrive. In only 10 minutes a day, you'll be able to deliver social and emotional learning and well-being tools throughout your school. To find out more, visit us at www.happyconfident.com. That's, that's interesting. Because only a few years ago, because this thing moves so quickly that as soon as you talk about the past, it's not that long ago when things were very different. And... The, the idea of the, the, the internet, for instance, as a new as kind of new public sphere, a, a public square in which all voices could be heard <laughs> and everyone would be able, everything would be free. And it's a sort of almost a, the Ben and Jerry's trajectory. You know, you start off doing something very hippie-ish and very organic, and soon enough, the big corporations take it over. And that tension between, between the control, that almost inevitably money and commercialization and organizations of that kind will start to suppress the original, beautifully idealistic, organic nature of, of the technology. I suppose that's the, tech, that's the sort of tension you're talking about there. It is. It, it's, uh, um, it's, you know, because we also, you know, and, and you have to, I think we have to also understand, you know, uh, when, when parents put children in the hands of, of an educational provider, they want to know that their children are safe. Uh, the same thing, the educators want to know that the children that they're working with um, are safe. Uh, so there, there's these aspects that uh, this risk awareness um, then may curtail some, uh, uh, you know, more expansive, I don't want to say innovative, because I think there's a lot of innovative action uh, happening in schools, but more expansive ways that link to what, you know, uh, children may need to know in the space outside of schools because let's face it one of the things that uh, um, we know is that uh, you know especially in the UK the majority of children will have access to uh, to technology even if it's not through their own devices by proxy by the devices of, of uh, friends siblings parents um, so they are going to be exposed to to those type of um, of experiences and it's better that they they understand you know what is good practice what is uh, uh, exemplary uh, behavior in those spaces so that they can also identify when someone is not doing something that uh, um, you know is ethical because uh, uh, and that has been something that we've been trying to work with 
with with um, secondary school uh, students is to not just to think about what is wrong, but rather how can we still be the ethical person in a situation where things, um, you know, where we we kind of encounter uh, examples of uh, of less, um, you know, reputable yeah, practices. That is interesting. Let's put it that way. I want to ask you about that idea of digital literacy and, and preparing students for that that kind of world. While you were talking, though, it struck me that you used the word safe. And of course, absolutely, as parents, you want kids to, you're worried about what they're up to on their computers. You're worried about what they might be. This, te- this technology is disruptive and its disruptiveness is exciting, but also dangerous. But of course, the word safe is if you ever listen to a very controlled society like China, how they describe any any intervention they make against people on the internet is always described in terms of social safety. So safety, safety can be, you know, social control, or it can be, necess- you know, a necessary concern that you're, you should you should be concerned with. <laughs> it's good. Exactly, that's a very Foucauldian uh, perspective on things, yeah. isn't it? Is a form of, uh, you know, what mentality are you trying to sell to govern yes. people, and, and and that is. And I think that's that's a lot. What um, you know, right now we have a handful of uh, of ed tech companies, and obviously this has been, uh, you know, they've kind of even packed themselves around us more during the pandemic. They saw a profit uh, opportunity there uh, for you know for institutions that were not so much invested in, in educational technology, and all of a sudden had to be. Uh, and and one of the things that it's their selling point is, is this idea that. Uh, it says safe is is also surveils, so it keeps uh, people on track. So learning analytics, it ke- understands how many how many times someone clicked on something on that. And the way it's it's uh, always sold is for learning efficiency and learning safety, uh, which you know it might it doesn't really talk to how this might shape the behavior of that person that understands that you know their actions are being. Um, you know, looked at uh, all all times when they're in those systems. So, yes, it, it's it's an aspect that uh, uh, you know it really depends on on what um, is important and where we you know what we where we place our emphasis. But uh, uh, and that's for me is is uh, is the key issue is is how uh, what mentalities and what rationalities are we selling uh, behind uh, these technologies. Um, so that kind of uh, in itself, it is a digital literacy to understand so, what um, you know what these technologies you, do you to us. You mentioned that you've um, been working with some primary schools or with primary school students with this kind of area of digital literacy. Uh, yes, yeah, so we, we're starting now with uh, uh, so we've we've done work with secondary uh, school uh, students uh, working on advanced digital literacies. Um, and then uh, uh, the trust has now asked us to work with uh, with children, and uh, and that is with the primary school children. And it's really interesting what we're going to do. So I'm I'm really excited uh, about this one because again, the 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 kind of the rationale for this project is very similar to the other, which is uh, it comes from a critical stance of uh, working with the knowledge of of the learners, and so. Uh, I think one of the worst things that we can do in terms of digital literacy, especially of the ones that you know speak to risk, is to tell people what to do, <laughs> especially at that age where you know you like to try things and and and, uh, and you may even think that you know more than the adult. Uh, so we go in with the approach of working first with what they know, uh, and then kind of tease out you know, those, what they know and what they've experienced through, uh, um, you know, things that we also know. So it becomes far more dialogic. Uh, And with this now project, what we want is also to have then the children uh, create resources to communicate what they learned through that process with other children. So we're going to uh, hopefully develop a set of picture books um, that are co-designed with the children and an illustrator uh, to to develop those those understandings. Um, so that has been the kind of uh, and and the ones in the secondary school were very successful because of that because we've uh, um, we've we did not go there with the intention to tell them 
our, you know, to, to kind of pass on our expertise, but rather working with, uh, um, with what they knew uh, and then building on that. Another layer for that project that we did as well was the fact that we brought uh, university students with us uh, and they were the ones that led the discussions. Um, so there was a kind of a more age proximity, which I think it helps. Uh, and that was one of the things that they said uh, in the interviews because the topics we was really advanced areas of digital literacy. So we were talking about uh, sexting, misinformation, so those areas, they felt far more um, kind of uh, comfortable speaking uh, about with, uh, with people that were closer to their kind of, you know, experience. And, and I think that worked so quite the, well. So the young people, the, the, the pupils, the students were able to share their use and experiences. In a sense, it was, so you said, you said it was dialogic. You kind of learned from them and developed this. Uh, there were guidelines, but you came with an open mind. Yes. So, you know, so obviously we're not asking them what they're there in the case of sexting, for example, what are their experiences of sexting? But we kind of uh, um, ask them to think, for example, how different types of groups think about it. So, you know, why, you know, what would be your parents' view of this? What is your teacher's view of this? What is someone that has just arrived at university view of this? What is your view on this? And then kind of, you know, for them to think about, uh, and it's really interesting because uh, um, they realize, you know, how, you know, their parents or, or teachers may think more about it as something that uh, um, is, uh, um, you know, dangerous. Uh, uh, it might not be for their advantage, uh, whereas they also, and the other thing that we kind of asked them to reflect about and we discussed about was, for example, uh, why do people do it? Why is it important to also understand uh, uh, rather than just to discard it, uh, why you know why do do we think that people may do that, um, and then think about you know what do we want to be and and uh, also because for example things with sexting what happens very often is that something that may be disclosed some that was something very intimate that more often than not is also a way of showing trust between people when it comes into the public domain. Um, the, the issue is scalability, is how, you know, it starts to get shared uh, by everyone. But thinking about, for example, of the ethical self, do we need, so if we understand that someone did that because they trusted someone and that trust was breached, it's our, may, might be our moral duty not to breach that trust any longer and stop that that kind of the same behavior. So it was quite interesting those things to for them to reflect because more often than not, you know, we might do things just because we think it's fun. We're not thinking about the other. We're not thinking about why this person was doing. We might just thinking that it was did not do it, you know, it wasn't appropriate or something. And and therefore if they thought if they did it, then it's not our problem. But you know, we are socially responsible for each other as well. So it, it's I think these are really interesting Thanks. I really enjoyed that project. <laughs> that sounds that sounds wonderful. I, I, I was while you were speaking, I was thinking of a terrible, really dis, dis, distressing sort of story in the news lately of a, of a of a young of um uh, some a, a, a suicide a, a, a young man who'd come across a suicide uh, victim. He killed himself, and uh, and the first thing he did was take his phone out and take a picture of him, take a picture of the dead body, and then share it on Facebook with a friend, and this. Was seen as a, a, a it was, it was a, hor a horrifying thing to do, and it just it was deeply distressing to parents of the of the young man. It was deeply distressing, but I thought to myself when I heard about this, I thought, well, I doubt that he's an evil person. It was it was almost that he lives in an age where sharing things like that has become part of your experience of everyday life. You see a thing that, of note, and you share it. You know, you it's it's as you say, a casual act of communication. With, impl with implications that didn't, didn't think through. And that's one aspect that I think we need to reflect, you know, as, as a collective on is how these, these you know, these media um, have kind of started to portray this need for uniqueness, um, you know, and in that case, you know, it's not every day that you would uh, thankfully find, uh, uh, you know, someone in, in that state. So, and these things are become embodied it uh and and 
more often than not unreflexive of what people do. Um, and so I, I think that these conversations need to happen with uh, with young people uh, that we don't need to, uh, you know, uh, to demonstrate uniqueness at the expense of other people. And, and the other people might not be just the immediate person. Uh, it might be the people that around this person are affected as well. Um, in my teaching, I speak about this a lot through an understanding of recognition as well. Um, you know, and recognition having like three pillars, uh, the pillar of care and love, you know, as the thing that we care for each other. And when we don't care for each other, uh, we're actually... Um, affecting someone's self-worth because it is essential. You know, that's one of the things that is essential for an individual to be recognized. Without recognition, we lose our currency in society. Um, You know, and on top of that, there's also the aspect of solidarity, which is uh, more often than not absent in those digital practices. because if someone is being affected, you know, being it bullied or, uh, you know, or mocked, or in this case, even worse, uh, you know, uh, their family being affected by image that they, you know, of their pain, um, the, this lack of solidarity uh, then, then create affects an individual, um, you know, about uh, regarding their, their self effectization their, their self-realization as an individual. Um, and so we need to think about these things because uh, more often than not, we do that for our own um, fulfillment, forgetting the, the, how this affects uh, someone else. And, and, and more often than not, that has to do with that filtered reality that we want to convey uh, also because of our need to be recognized. So it, this is the interesting aspect because we also need validation from elsewhere. And if we are in, in, the, um, in communities where portraying that uniqueness day in, day out, uh, and you don't have anything else now to portray that uniqueness, you're going to find, even if it's in extreme examples, of what that uniqueness um, is, um, you know, sometimes in very bad ways. It's a very ancient desire among human beings to, to share that piece of gossip, to know that thing that would be, you know, that you could share and so forth. But the new new technologies create an environment in which as you say, there is an emphasis on the uniqueness of the experience, which can be captured. Since you can capture that experience in photography, you know, ever since the, ever since photo- photographs came along, then there then there's a desire to be photographed. Now there's digital technology. There's a desire to record moment by moment life, and that that changes your view of what what a, a successful and um, productive person might be. Someone who has these experiences, so it feeds back on itself. Do you think that presents a particular problem for us humans <laughs> as we go forward? Yes, I, I think it is. You know, the big difference with photography was something to create memory. Uh, I'm not sure right now that we're using social media to create memory. We don't go back to posts, you know, two, three years ago, necessarily. Uh, we, we're always hunting for the next one. Um, yeah, and, and, and the, I think the biggest impact that is already here is on uh, on well being, uh, and again, sell a sense of self. Because you know, then if you cannot afford that holiday, if you cannot afford that nice pair of trainers, if you cannot constantly, uh, you know, um, sh- evidence uh, the type of of kind of uh, cultural traits that's your circle of of uh, uh, of you know of followers i'm not even want to call them friends uh have then you know you're not in um and obviously there has always been cliques there's always been kind of uh, groups that people associated with but but here is that the the cultural element of of uh, of picturing uh and of kind of filtering that reality it kind of pl- puts a, a lot of uh, uh, stress on, on people, I, I would say. It places a lot of uh, um, emphasis on always being something that you might not necessarily be. And, and that's quite, for young people in particular, I think that's that's a very hard toll yes, on there's them. A, there's, there's a digital inequality in the sense of people's access to technology, but there's also the inequality of, of kind of expectation. I can see a world I can't participate in. I can see things I I can never actually have, and the the um, 
the influencer is always more beautiful and more perfect and more filtered <laughs> all that sort of thing you know and uh, in that sense i suddenly i am whether i liked it or not i mean equal I'm, I'm unequal it's an unequalizing kind of technology yeah you know that that's the thing is you know when when the web uh, you know the web being the kind of the system that sits on top of the internet uh, uh, that creates this this uh, more social and uh, interactive and being able to participate and to create um uh, aspect of of our you know digital use was developed with uh, with the kind of a spirit of democracy uh in which you know you were supposed to break boundaries was supposed to kind of uh, uh, in a way uh er eradicate knowledge gatekeepers uh but with the purpose of people becoming more knowledgeable <laughs> which is the kind of the antithesis i guess uh if you want to paint a very bleak uh picture of what uh, is happening because what is happening is we're more and more uh engaged in echo chambers so people are are seem to be a bit less tolerant of of being in spaces where you don't necessarily uh agree with everything and then in that pers uh, a lot you know forces you to pursue the acceptance of others uh, again as a form of recognition um and so the these create create inequalities because uh again not just of the technologies haves and have nots but more of the cultural and social aspects of uh, of digital participation because it's not just enough for you to be able to create an account you have to you're craving for a following for that acknowledgement of what you put in there um and when that doesn't come uh then it has uh, an impact on uh, on people because uh they don't you know because there's this kind of natural aspect of comparing ourselves to others uh and that creates a hierarchy of value uh that is not necessarily reflective of the true self but is reflective of that digital image that we've created of our, or, or that we aim to create of ourselves This is Teachers Talk Radio and this is Teachers Talk Radio News. The Telegraph reported this week on calls from some academics for schools to ban smartphones. The article refers to devices as extremely dangerous over fears that they damage cognitive ability. The research by academics in Australia suggests that phones can be hazardous to children as they have a negative effect on learning, social skills and mental health. Dr. Mark Williams, an honorary professor of cognitive neuroscience at Macquarie University in Sydney, is quoted as saying that having a phone in a pocket or bag decreases working memory capacity and that this means children don't learn as well. He goes on to say that there are zero benefits to smartphones in schools. Dr. Williams went on to add that other research studies have shown that smartphones also link to causes of depression, anxiety, and body dysmorphia. In Spain, phones have been banned from schools in some regions since 2015. University of Valencia academics found that pupils' test scores in some core subjects improved. In the USA, researchers at an Ohio hospital found that screen time led to lower brain functioning, and a study in Ma Malaysia published in 2020 found that the presence of a smartphone decreased the ability of undergraduates to accurately recall information. The current Department for Education and Advice in England is that head teachers are best placed to make decisions about phones and their use in school. The value of learning a foreign language is often discussed in schools, but in Germany there have been calls for primary schools to scrap English lessons. The president of the German Teachers Association has said that schools should focus on German reading and maths instead. His remarks come as German students scored lower than their peers in other countries in the International Primary School Reading Survey. Heinz Peter Meidinger told German broadcasters that focusing on English was a wrong priority and that more attention should be paid to reading skills, writing skills and arithmetic. The BBC reports that MPs have launched an inquiry into Ofsted school inspections 
looking at how useful they are to parents, governors and schools in England. Education Select Committee Chairman Robin Walker said Ofsted had an important role, but that there had been a groundswell of criticism in recent months. Ofsted itself has said it welcomed the inquiry, but that it had already made changes. MPs will consider how inspections affect the workload and well-being of school staff and pupils, and what contribution its reports make to helping schools improve. The issues likely to be discussed are the current system of awarding one overall grade to a school, and whether it is right to deem a school inadequate if inspectors raise concerns about child welfare. Parents, school governors, teachers and unions will be able to submit evidence alongside the government and Ofsted itself. Ofsted have already made changes, particularly to the complaints process, but the NAHT's Paul Whiteman said the changes didn't go far enough. Finally, in the West Midlands, the BBC reports that a 91-year-old former teacher is helping children develop their literacy skills from a living room. Diane Idols has five pupils she reads with over an online platform aimed at helping children progress with reading. She said the volunteering work had filled a huge hole in her life after the death of her husband. Mrs Idols volunteers through the Bookmark Reading Charity, which matches trained volunteers with primary children struggling with reading. This has been your Teachers Talk Radio News with Joe Fox. You're listening to the Friday Morning Break with John Gibbs. My guest this week, Dr. Christina Costa, Associate Professor at Durham University. We are discussing her research into schools in a digital world. And does it does it also change our way of experiencing ordinary life in that sense that now I'm, instead of just, uh, much of human uh, existence must have been forgetting. There must have been a tremendous amount of forgetting. <laughs> you know, what did I do yesterday? What did I do this afternoon? No, I don't know. Or yesterday morning. But now, I, I view my own human experience as one in which I can I can record. I, I must evaluate everything in terms of how will I how will how will I present this to others? I was struck this one. I went to a museum in London, the British Museum, and there was a crowd of people around the Rosetta Stone, it's a very famous artifact, and they're all phones are out. The phones they're fo- they're filming themselves looking at a thing and filming each other looking at the thing. I thought, well, are you actually looking at that thing or you're filming yourself looking at that thing? You've become the kind of object of your own production. <laughs> well, you know, maybe I'm getting carried away here, but I, I think it does change the way we react to the world. It does, you know, these things, they're, they're not neutral. Um, I think uh, um, there's uh, probably um, less uh, of an experience of living in the moment when you're living through a screen. Uh, that does filter your your perception of uh, you know of reality, um, and also because of that concern of what you're doing there is not really appreciating you know the art or or the learning that is supposed to be attaining through that experience, but rather concerned how you're going to convey that uh, experience to others. So there's a different dimension. I think there's a lot that can be lost. You know. Uh, if we only focus on that, I think I'm, you know, um, it's, it's, I, I'm, you know, I, I, my perspective is that uh, it's almost impossible these days to live without technology because there's, there's still quite, there's a lot of things that are very good, <laughs> but it is understanding uh, when to use technology how to use it that will make a difference. And, and again, that is another key literacy. And then we can talk a little bit more about how I see literacy, but these are, are the kind of aspects that, uh, you know, it may need to be inside the curriculum, not necessarily as a one-off, but as something that models behavior moving forward. And usually I give the example of crossing the road, you know, uh, you will drive children to, to school because, uh, you know, it's safe or, but at some point, it doesn't matter. They're not always going to have a chauffeur. Uh, and even if they do, at some point, they might be curious about the road. So we need to teach them how to cross the road safely. Uh, and uh, um, so that if they ever choose to do so, they can do it proficiently. 
Um, and I think these are the kind of uh, um, aspects that we can um, create routines and create experiences uh, for people to, to think about these things rather than, uh, than you know, learning on their own. So what does the, the, um, the, the, the literate, the digitally literate person of the future look like? I mean, you mentioned the sort of green, the sort of green cross code, look both ways and so on. But what, what is the, what is the, the well, the well, the, the very literate digital human? So the, the very well uh, digital literate human will have what I call digital cultural knowledge. Um, and that means to then go up a scale of digital literacy that obviously starts with, uh, you know, which comes very intuitively now for everyone, which is you're able to create an account and you have, do not need to be taught how to create that account because they all look very similar. So you put your name, your email, all that, create accounts, use the technology. Uh, it's quite, you know, the majority of, uh, of technological applications are quite intuitive these days for social use, at least. Then you have another level, which is uh, a level of kind of, uh, so you have the, the, the kind of technology, then you have the use as well of how uh, you might, you know, you understand how these technologies, what they're used for. So you kind of develop a, a, a kind of a, an understanding. And more often than not, people think that at this level, everyone is literate. And that's probably uh, the biggest misconception uh, because uh, just because we know that in a discussion forum is to discuss things and in a, you know, an Instagram, we put, put a picture uh, that doesn't uh, uh, make us literate at the very high level. So we need to go into the, the cultural level of, of digital literacy which where we, we learn how to be digital citizens uh, and, and where, you know, we, we kind of understand privacy uh, of our ourselves, but of others, also how privacy is enacted by um, by tech by tech companies, uh, datification, ethics, culturally, how are these spaces? You know, how do these spaces shape our cultural action um, as well? So basically, we have to understand uh, how do we navigate these spaces for our own benefit, um, and by doing that, we can then. Uh, start to understand where these spaces are kind of interfering, for example, with our well-being. And when, you know, and when it's, uh, you know, this is not useful because a lot of the, uh, the spaces that I'm currently involved are manipulating a certain type of message that is not really, I'm not gaining anything from it. Uh, but... You know, so these are the kind of things that needs to we need to reflect and, and we need to understand. And more often than not, it's because these the rules have not been written. You know, we we've been uh, uh, you know in in the kind of a, a more uh, analog world, there has been rules about what uh, you know, or at least we've been taught from very young age what to do and what not to do. Um, and but we are not. It yet, that's my personal view, um, able to read the digital room all the time. I was going to say some of this digital literacy will come from painful experience. I, I think I can remember look, before there was ever Facebook, there was a thing called MySpace, and people would just put their lives online, <laughs> everything about themselves, and they paint them. That was a painful realisation, I'm sure, when they, they shared too much about themselves in a world. Or people who shared a, a, a rather unfortunate joke with a friend and realized soon enough it was around the world that 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 sort of realization is sort of organically happening i mean for instance i i i guess there can't be many can there be many young teenagers who look at look at a picture of someone on the internet no it's not probably it's filtered you know they don't necessarily look like that 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 that, that they will they will in a sense become more dig digitally literate I, I, you know, I think so, and I, and I hope so. You, you also see that a lot of uh, uh, young people, um, if you go to their Instagram account or other tools that have a kind of a more ephemeral uh, type of function, that is the function that they use the most. So, for example, uh, I see that um, not that I follow a lot of uh, young people, but uh, people that are, uh, you know, part of my family uh, that are on Facebook, they actually don't really have anything on, on, or on Facebook, on Instagram. They don't really have a lot of things on Instagram uh, as probably older people have, but they use the story feature a lot. 
So they, you know, it's something that is there for a couple of hours and then kind of disappears, um, which again creates another type of, uh, of uh, issue, which is uh, the time issue that people will always want to be on, not to miss out on, on something. Um, I do think that, you know, people will learn and, and uh, even, you know, you and Abmas talked about the, uh, how, you know, it is hopeful that people will learn and, and that at some point uh, a digital public sphere can happen um, online. But uh, th- there has to be a kind of probably more realization uh, and, and more discussions around this because one of the things that the research points towards is that uh, you know, which is not very different from what happens already in schools in other contexts, is that uh, people that um, have higher levels of, uh, 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 you know, of cultural understandings, um, you know, I don't want to call it, but it's cultural capital, it already translates for, for that. Uh, so I think here is teachers and parents are, are key actors in, uh, uh, in kind of... Uh, guiding young people into these spaces as well so that people can understand uh you know when to use it for their benefit also for their entertainment uh but at the same time uh knowing you know what to share when to share but also uh uh you know seizing the day in different ways not everything has to be online um and there is a divide about those that think of the internet or these tools just as an entertainment in those that also see learning potential. And, and I think that is the approach that we also want to impart is that uh, we can learn from these things. You know, there there's a wealth of knowledge out there uh, alongside a wealth of misinformation, but uh, there are spaces yes. that, you know. It's that, <laughs> it is that paradox, isn't it? Never before in human experience have people had a library so vast at their, at their fingertips and yet uh, people watch kittens falling out of baskets yes. and, and so on. <laughs> the commonest thing is to see cute animals. <laughs> so is that, you know, is it, are we talking bread and circuses? Is this just distraction or is it the most extraordinary ca- uh, capacity for extending our human senses that we've ever seen? And it's probably both of those things. This is Two Minute Tech with Steve Woods, your tech briefing on Teachers Talk Radio. Hello, this week I'm going to answer the question we all want to know. What is the best presentation software? I do promise to give you an answer this week after leaving you on a cliffhanger, but first a quick recap for those who missed last week or fast forwarded me. Considering most lessons delivered in a classroom contain some sort of presentation it's possible that our students are facing up to a thousand presentations a year. This isn't a bad thing as we are presenting information and that's what the software is designed to do. However like a display you spend ages on how long does it take before it stops being noticed? Do we really know what experience a pupil gets through a typical week in school? Are they being engaged or do they know how to look like they are listening? Don't worry there is There's no way I'm going to mention slant here if you're thinking that is where I was going next. The answer is there is no best presentation software. As I've already mentioned, there are lots of free and paid for presentation apps out there. The key to success is which one do you choose? This is where a lot of people go wrong. They ask someone else's opinion. What works for one may not work for another. The choice you make depends on two key words, purpose and audience. When you choose the method of presentation for a lesson, you need to be thinking about the best way to grab focus. In the end, our job is to encourage long-term remembering. So if the lesson is about remembering short text-based facts and you have powerful images that back up what you're saying, a looping PowerPoint presentation or equivalent may do the job. Do you want to embed a lot of web links and videos? Why not take a look at Wakelet, a free way to collect web links together and share them. You can present with it and then hand the link off for self-discovery. Most app developers today aim to make their apps intuitive so changing things around shouldn't be too hard for you to get to grips with and you may just find engagement rises and in the end that's what it's all about what do you do to engage pupils let us know at tt radio official i'm steve woods and that was two minute tech two minute tech with steve woods your tech briefing on teachers talk radio You're listening to the Friday Morning Break with John Gibbs, 
My guest this week, Dr. Christina Costa, Associate Professor at Durham University. We are discussing her research into schools in a digital world. It's both, you know, but again, it's what we make of it. Um, But obviously the temptation is always there for the things that entertain us. Um, And and while it entertains us, it's okay, I guess. The issue is that alongside all these, the kittens and, uh, and, you know, and the cute puppies, there's also a more kind of dark side uh, to to the web that impinges a lot on uh, on people's well-being. So there, there are parallel, there's... There's different layers, uh, and uh, and understanding which ones are helpful for us and which ones are not uh, is is again is a, is a key advanced digital literacy. I'm calling advanced now, but probably should be a basic one, uh, so that we can understand where these things might lead us to spaces uh, and experiences that are not necessarily useful uh, or even healthy for us. No, if the internet is the greatest library in human experience, then there's no librarian (laughs) to to helpfully say you're not ready for that book yet or (laughs) whatever. Were you you surprised, shocked or amazed by ChatGPT when it came out? Or you said that I knew this was coming, this was... Um, I I was not surprised. Uh, uh, I actually um, thought it was, you know, it could have been, I kind of, I guess what I was surprised is how it came uh, uh, so fast after the pandemic, but also uh, again, how this is a reflection of, uh, of all the data and all the kind of the investments that have been made in technology during the pandemic. Uh, obviously this was not new artificial intelligence has been uh, going around uh, uh, for, uh, for a long time, but you know, obviously now it's being materialized and open to the public. Um, in that way. What I'm, uh, uh, again, not surprised, but uh, uh, probably uh, a bit saddened is, uh, um, and and here I speak more from the higher education space, uh, because that's the one where I've been thinking about this more uh, recently, is uh, is how uh, we are now all upset and a bit daunted by uh, what this is going to do to assessment. Um, whereas in my perspective is, if you take a critical stance to education, where you know it's based on uh, people bringing their own experiences, bringing their own uh, views on things, uh, chat GTP will never be uh, um, a kind of a competitor for, for education. Uh, but if we are relying on people uh, just, uh, you know, reflecting on what was said in a lecture in a paper, then we have a big problem. Uh, so this is where the practical side of education needs to come out more and where um, different types of, of assessment that don't rely on people, you know, in one way or another, even if it's an exam or, or, or an essay, uh, replicate what was given to them. Uh, then, then this is where the problems are. And, but I'm hopeful that this does create a crisis of meaning uh, for education to the point that we then change that regime of, uh, you know, to make something more interactive, more meaningful for people. Because I think this is, I think we're losing it. And again, it's a reflection of what is happening online. We may be losing a bit of the meaning of higher education. Not that I think higher education is not meaningful, but is the way we package it. Uh, I think more and more we need people to be able to think critically and and to be educated. Uh, but the way the models by which we do this uh, needs to be to be rethought. So maybe uh, there is an opportunity here. I, I I hope so. I think that's a hopeful thought, and I think the 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 phrase you just used of the crisis of meaning to you know sometimes a crisis is, is a good thing and. If it leads you to evaluate, I think nothing, nothing exposes some of the problems of education more than the assessment process. You know, it's, it's when you're teaching, you think this is we're expansive, we're we're thoughtful, we're creative, we're interactive, but then then it comes down to an exam room or a pen and a paper and what you can recall, and you realize how limited the 
end product often is. Well, if chat GPT and other things make, 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 make lecturers and higher education and teachers say, well, you know, that, that since the machine can do it for most of our kids, maybe we'll think more creatively about how we assess and how we teach. Yeah. And I think we need to assess the process as well. We need to, you know, and I think assessment is also, again, maybe we need another word because we need to value the process. We need to value the engagement of people as part of their learning and how they go about that. And again, how they work with others, uh, how they produce understandings out of that. And again, this is very reflective of what is happening online because, you know, there's a lot of interesting uh, you know, examples of young people uh, doing things online, creating their own meaning, pushing the agenda. Uh, you know, you see that with the climate change uh, uh, manifestations. You see that with other projects that young people are passionate about. So why are we not learning from them and bringing that into um, into education? Uh, so I, I think it's, uh, you know, what technology is showing us that, you know, we need to to acknowledge the process of learning more than than we actually do it's time for a fresh start to language learning pearson edexcel's new student-centered french german and spanish 2024 gcses cater to the needs of all learners regardless of their background ability or reason for studying Rooted in learned language knowledge, their assessments are transparent and accessible, allowing all students to showcase their language skills. Through inclusive and relatable content, the new Pearson Edexcel MFL GCSEs build a shared cultural capital that helps students develop an understanding of and appreciation for the wider world. Find out more at go.pearson.com forward slash MFL GCSE 24. This programme has been brought to you by The Happy Confident Company. Our clinically approved, ready-to-go wellbeing and mental health programme will help your pupils thrive. In only 10 minutes a day, you'll be able to deliver social and emotional learning and wellbeing tools throughout your school. To find out more, visit us at www.happyconfident.com. And the technologies, technologies always change what, what you think of as the, the things people should know. And, you know, in the age, in the age before writing that was presumably a verbal world of knowledge and you, the storyteller was valued in the age of print the, the people who could write and remember were valued and so on and so on and so on so now we have to value different things um, and it will change the way we think of the, about the validity and the hierarchy of knowledge I was thinking about the, the work of people like Neil Postman a few years ago who, who pointed out that when you introduce edu uh, when you introduce technologies the technology which you think is going to be a servant soon becomes the master, and you, you, you become the servant to the technology. And I saw that a lot in education, how because you could collect data on students far more finely than ever before, that's what you did. You collected data on students. And it wasn't always dead clear what you were using that data for, but in soon, soon enough, the education process itself became the collection of data. Is there, is there a danger of that, that, we are, that the digital age turns us into quantifiers of things rather than rather than living more, you know, less, less definably. I, I think so. And again, it's, uh, um, it won't be a danger as long as we don't let the ed tech companies dictate what technologies can do. Um, and, but I think there's a kind of a, a marvel about, oh, we can have all of this data and, you know, and we live in a, in a world, uh, that is thirsty for data, um, but not very useful data because just because someone clicked on something for so many times or spent so many, you know, much many minutes in in this space that I created is not going to show me how they've interacted, what they thought about it, uh, you know, how meaningful that was for them. So it's it's a kind of an artificial point of data, but uh, from a computer scientist perspective or from someone uh, that uh, you know is crunching numbers, that is quite fascinating. Uh, you know, and I was thinking when you were talking about uh, Postman, I was thinking about Paul Freire that talks about, uh, you know, he obviously didn't live to see technology as it is today. But one of the things that he always said is that uh, n nothing, you know, that is introduced to education should ever uh, deter education from its main main goal, which is humanizing the process of learning. 
and, and I think when we hide behind uh, these uh, numbers, uh, you know, we're, we're kind of creating students as data as well. Uh, so these, these can be uh, problems. I think the other issue is um, the standardized uh, uh, technologies that we are using in education, again, with this mentality of risk averse, uh, you know, safe space, uh, is that more often than not, it restricts what we can do in those spaces uh, because we are now going with the function that the technology offers rather than uh, uh, what we probably wanted to do. Um, so that can be uh, quite inhibiting of, uh, of, what, uh, uh, of what else uh, uh, could, could be done is, is a restriction that we have to think about. And then there is the side effects as well. So I was thinking uh, some time ago, I was talking to some of my students uh, that they were using, I don't know if, uh, um, so it was not class dojo, but it was, uh, uh, I think it was called class charts. Uh, which is a technology that uh, uh, gathers data about students across the years in schools. And, uh, and it, it's so efficient to the point that if you are putting that that student is a difficult student, uh, it will, uh, you know, give you an option where you should sit that student, for example. So that is among other students. Um, and what it does, for example, for people that uh, uh, like supply teachers that come in for the day, they can have a look at the system and see which student it's what. And it's based on a, on a, on a point system. So, and there was uh, one of my students was telling me that there was one of these kids that had missed to bring pencils to class three times. So they had all these red dots against, uh, against their name. And the immediate reaction is, oh, this is some kid that is going to give me a hard time. So we are already stigmatizing because of the data uh, that, you know, it, it kind of links to that. Uh, so it can create inequalities uh, in that sense, because we're already creating an image of a student that we haven't even yet met. We haven't yet given them a chance, uh, um, you know, and, th and that record will accompany the student as long as whatever schools they're going to be in. Uh, use that system. So, and that's the way it's sold is sold as, as they cross data that, you know, doesn't matter. This is a, a record of the student that is going to accompany. Do we need that? You know, so, or, or do we need to know the student individually? Sorry, going on and around here. <laughs> no, no, fascinating. Oh, Cause that is a perfect example of the way in which you think it's going to be a really useful tool. Well, I'd, I'd go in the classroom, I'd see the students and don't sit him next to him. Absolutely, I, I got that now. How useful is that when I don't know? I've, been, I've done cover lessons where you don't know the kids. and uh, Do you always sit there? Yes, I will sit here. Mm, okay. Uh, so that might be useful. But of course, it, but it leads you to a misleading if every time his pencil is not there, yes. that comes down as a misbehavior. It's a bit like crime figures, you know. Um, if, if, if you register the stealing of milk bottles off of doorsteps as a crime, then if a lot of milk bottles get stolen, then that's a high crime area and the police are patrolling the streets more or something. So it's a misleading. Data is very, very can be very misleading, especially if you, and if you generate a lot of it, you're likely to find more of that. Exactly. And, and the other side effect that was really, I wasn't expecting is this idea that, you know, because also then teachers are accountable towards their actions. If you have, you know, a class where you give a lot of, let's say, for argument's sake, a lot of red points to children, then there's a reflection on you as well. As a teacher that may not have the leadership that is required. So it kind of creates all of these kind of uh, um, aspects that, you know, they no one have thought about that because they were thinking from a technical perspective of what technology can do, but not really on the social consequences of uh, um, of technology, which you know, again, this is where I think educational technologies need to be developed with the in more in more in more close collaboration with uh, uh, with curriculum designers, with educators, uh, with teachers, because they're the ones that you know uh, understand their environments. And that's interesting, you, you, because earlier you mentioned Foucault, and of course there's the idea of the surveillance society, and the and it isn't just that you are being watched, it's that you think you're being watched. And as soon as you think you're being watched, or you could be being watched, then that's how you behave. 
uh, and that idea that well, since this could be measured, everything I do must be a lot. A, I must identify what I do along the lines of, it, of measurability, and soon I become the surveilled, you know, the, the surveilled human. Well, I, I remember um, someone saying, "Would would it be good if we could have uh, video cameras in the corner of each classroom, so that the people could keep an eye on what was going on in the school and know what was?" I thought, Definitely not. <laughs> Because as soon as I have that camera there, I'm a different kind of teacher altogether. Yeah, it's it's. I think it totally shapes the way uh, people then then behave. Um, and I think again, what is lost is is this aspect of authenticity of also probably caring. Um, you know, which care the aspect of care can take on a lot of uh, uh, you know shapes. Sometimes you might need to tell someone off to so that you're telling them that you're caring about them, you know, if that if that makes sense. Uh, so it's not always a straightforward, uh, you know, or recipe like approach the way we deal with different people. But when we are being surveilled, then we're thinking about the interpretation of others to our intentions, and and that will shape the way we, uh, we you know, we do things. Yeah. And a d digitally measured world isn't one where there's a much chaos, and yet chaos and and things going wrong and mistakes and and things that look strange from the outside are exactly uh, what human experience, probably teaching included, is like. <laughs> so, uh, what is finally? We have run out of time, so I'll ask my final question. What is the it, it, in the end? In the future, are you optimistic about the digital world? Is it going to be a great tool, or is it, or, or should we be very cautious? I mean, the, the prime minister announced they're going to have a, what is, a, a some sort of conference or symposium in Britain on on uh, AI, and uh, people are warning about you know robots of the future and extermination of the human race. It was actually seriously mentioned recently in the news. Should we be that concerned? Was it, or was it, or is every technology frightening? You know, people were scared of American television when I was a kid. Don't let your kids watch American television. They'll all go violent. Is it simply that sort of panic? I, I think it's good to think about these things because uh, uh, this does not affect just the world of learning. It will affect the world of work. Um, and so we need to think about how we organize society differently if we're going to have technology replace a lot of, you know, uh, work, especially low-skilled work, so that which will uh, affect. You know, again, is not the first time that this happens, but I think we we should have learned by now that we need to have securities and plans in place to cater for people that will be uh, the most affected. Uh, in te in terms of education, again, I think we need to, especially at higher education, rethink considerably uh, of how we organize learning and and how we value learning. Um, and so that is the uh, the wake up call. Um, and I think there has to be ethical regulation, um, you know, and, and it hasn't been just the, the UK uh, government. The UNESCO has actually met with uh, most of the um, education ministries uh, across the world to discuss AI recently and has uh, now provided their own views on, on it. Um, so I think there there's aspects here of uh, uh, inequality and uh, uh, that will come to the fore if uh, um, you know things are not put in place. I don't think we can stop it, but I think we can ethically regulate it. Uh, and, and and I'm hoping that uh, uh, that is what's going to happen and not you know fall again in a trap of um, of what companies want and what they think is going to boost their uh, their enterprises. Uh, but rather that we're going to focus on the human uh, aspect. Um, so that that is my kind of answer, which is not very direct, but uh, uh, you know that that's where I am at right now. Well, thank you so much. Yes, I'll focus on the human. I'll, I'll go with that. Uh, well, Christina, thank you so much for your time. I've really enjoyed our conversation, and I think our listeners as well. I think you can't talk about this stuff enough. So thank you for joining me on Teachers Talk. Thank you. you. It's been my pleasure. I really enjoyed uh, talking to you. And that brings to a close another episode 
of the Friday Morning Break with John Gibbs. My guest this week was Dr. Christina Costa, Associate Professor at Durham University. We discussed the digital world and its effect on schools. If you've enjoyed this discussion, you can listen to it again as a podcast on Spotify and multiple other platforms. Thank you for listening. You've been listening to Teachers Talk Radio. Tune in live and listen back at ttradio.org. We look forward to hearing from you next time on Teachers Talk Radio.